Managing your law practice can be challenging. Marketing, time management, attracting clients, and all the things besides the cases that you need to do that aren't billable. Welcome to this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. This is where you'll get the information you need from expert guests and host Christopher Anderson, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast, helping attorneys achieve more success. We're glad you can listen today on the Legal Talk Network. I am your host, Christopher Anderson, and I'm an attorney with a singular passion for helping other lawyers be more successful with their law firm businesses. My team at How to Manage a Small Law Firm and I work directly with lawyers across the country to help them achieve success as they define it. In the unbillable hour each month, we explore an area important to growing revenues, giving you back more of your time, and or improving your professional satisfaction in one of the key areas of your business. As an attorney who has built and managed my own law firms in Georgia and New York City, I now get to work with hundreds of law firm owners to help them grow professionally and personally. I start with the fundamental premise that a law firm business exists primarily to provide for the financial, personal, and professional needs of you, its owner. In this program, I have a chance to speak to you as I do in presentations across the country about what it takes to build and operate your law firm like the business that it is. I have a chance to introduce you to a new guest each month to talk about how to make that business work for you instead of the other way around. Now, before we get started today, I do want to say a thank you to our sponsor, Answer One. Answer One is a leading virtual receptionist and answering services provider for lawyers. You can find out more by giving them a call at 800 Answer One or online at www.answerone.com. And again, that's www. Then dot answer, then the number one, dot com. Today's episode of the Unbillable Hour is Marketing Game Plan for 2017. Being near the beginning of the new year, it is good to discuss the beginning of your business. And it all starts with marketing. Every day you don't earn new business is a day in which your business dies just a little bit. Unfortunately, many law firm owners approach marketing fairly haphazardly. The marketing vendors and providers that they talk to don't make it any easier. They ask us about what our budget is, but they rarely ask us about our goals. They don't ask why, and then we're surprised when we don't get the results that we hoped for. This is, of course, because hope is not a plan. And my guest today is Chelsea Lambert. Chelsea has worked with law firms and other businesses on understanding, building, and executing marketing plans that work. And Chelsea's going to share with us today some really important strategies to use marketing to drive your business forward. Chelsea, welcome to the Unbillable Hour. Thank you so much for having me, Christopher. My pleasure. Now, first of all, I know my introduction of you was really, really brief. So if you wouldn't mind, just to kind of give some context, help our listeners understand um, how you came to work with law firms and with other businesses on marketing, uh, what a little bit of your background is. Absolutely. So I have been in the small law firm space for over a decade now, spending seven years with a legal technology and marketing startup creating products for law firms, such as marketing services, uh, case management software, payment processing, and a variety of other tools. I've been speaking and writing on um, these topics since that time as well. I had a consulting practice following that engagement where I match made technology and marketing uh, with the small firms and their goals, and then also helped them recruit people to run those systems. I transitioned into marketing legal technology to small firms and then finally found my today home at How to Manage a Small Law Firm where I serve as Vice President of Marketing, travel across the country, uh, avidly speaking and writing on the topic. And my passion is really seeing small law firms adopt marketing practices and technology and systems and processes that help them run their businesses more efficiently and more profitably, which is the key word in that sentence is the the profitable piece. My personal belief is that marketing should serve the business. It should protect the business. Um, And we're going to get into the why and how behind that today. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Chelsea. And I'll just uh, also mention to the listeners that you know, I've known Chelsea uh, for years. I've encountered Chelsea on the speaking circuit, um, in the marketplace, um, speaking to and teaching to uh, law firms, um, as well as other businesses, uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And I've watched lawyers take what she's taught, take the principles that she's going to be talking about today and put them to great use. So I'm really excited for our listeners and for myself to get underway. Chelsea, what I'd like to do is start with um, just a very basic premise, because I think lawyers, um, and honestly, lots of small business folks, think about marketing in a very uh, narrow way, um, in a very monolithic way, and are surprised to learn that marketing has two main jobs, the one that everybody's familiar with, and then another one that, that lawyers are a little bit more reluctant to engage in. I was wondering if you might just share with us what you see as like the two main jobs of marketing. Yeah, absolutely. So marketing is commonly confused for a service or a method to make leads rain from the sky and, you know, bringing in tons and tons of traffic, tons and tons of people, and a successful marketing campaign is often um, misunderstood as one that creates like a massive line out your door. Well, Mm -hmm. it doesn't help if the massive line out your door is 90% people that have no interest in your services, don't understand what you do, or have an expectation that you're never going to be able to meet. So the job of marketing is actually, one, to bring the right quantity of the right quality of the right prospects to your door. So it is actually not just to attract the attention and to bring awareness about your law firm, but it's to filter out and make sure that the right message is being communicated to them so that if you, let's say, do family law, you don't have 100 people standing outside or calling your office that are looking for a bankruptcy attorney right? um, because you won't be able to help them. And then the second part is to actually protect the staff, um, your other clients who are happy, who are paying you, who are loyal to you and your services, who are good referral sources or potential referral sources, it's actually to protect the business. Because by filtering out all of the people who are not going to be a good fit, like for example, just within our organization, I try, my, my goal is to never have sales get on the phone with someone who isn't potentially a good fit as a client and really, you know, focusing on what that ideal is and protecting, shielding the business from anyone who doesn't fit those criteria. Because what it does is it seals away from the time that you're able to spend with clients, from the time that you're able to spend doing quality business development activities. It creates distractions, um, and a laundry list of of other issues. So one, to bring the right quantity of the right quality of the right people at the right time uh, and should be something that you can dial up and dial down. So, you know, turning up the marketing when you need more and turning it down when, when your staff needs time to actually deliver and then to protect the business from as many of the bad eggs as you possibly can. Right. And, and by protect the business, I mean, you mentioned one key part, which is to protect sales so that uh, sales isn't having a conversation with someone who won't end up being a great client um, and thereby not paying attention, not being available to someone who might be. Um, and it's also, of course, to protect the whole rest of the business, right? To protect the production line, um, the, you know, the production of the work, the people who get quality work done for your great clients from having to work with a crappy client who's going to churn them and waste their time. It's to protect the people who work in the factory from being burned out by bad clients. It's to protect everything about the business from the bad effects of working with the wrong client, eventually even marketing, which will be damaged by having worked with a client you shouldn't have and thereby having a bad referral out there. Um, So I think that's just a really great point. And then I think one thing that's also overlooked sometimes in keeping the wrong people away from your door, as you called it, you're also not wasting their time, right? Marketing should prevent the business from talking to and wasting the time of someone who the business doesn't really need to be helping. No, and, and help them by allowing them to go find the attorney that is right for them. So you're denying them by pulling in people who are not a good fit for 
your services and forcing them through a sales cycle that isn't necessarily the right fit for either of you, you're denying them the opportunity for quality representation from an attorney who is best suited for their situation. Yeah. So understanding, Chelsea, thanks so much for the two jobs of marketing, what the two jobs of marketing are and how it is equally important really to keep the wrong types of clients away from the rest of the business for their sake as well as for the business's sake. What I'd like to turn our attention now is to, you know, marketing again, you know, we talk about marketing as if it's this sort of monolithic entity, this this one big thing that a firm should do. But in talking to you, preparing for the show, you helped me to understand that there's really three main areas of marketing. You talked to me about PR and media, about inbound, and about digital. And I was wondering if you could explain to our listeners what each of those three are. Absolutely. So you use different areas of marketing as your business grows and evolves. You also use different areas of marketing or different components based on what your goals are. For example, and just to kind of give you a quick summary of these three areas. So media and PR would be referring to articles published in nationally or locally recognized publications, such as magazines uh, or newspapers or TV spots where you're not placing an advertisement where you're actually being interviewed on a television show or a podcast or an article printed in, in a magazine that someone might buy off of a newsstand or a nationally recognized newspaper. That falls into the media and PR area. Okay. Of which you can often hire a public relations, and PR stands for public relations. Uh, you can hire a PR agency. This is when you would do a press release. Uh, and so that is one segment of marketing. And that area is typically used when you are launching a brand, when you have accomplished something such as um, making the Inc. 5000 list or making the Law Firm 500 list uh, or have had a, a huge achievement that happens within the firm. Anything that is essentially news falls into that category. And it can be very- A big settlement or, or, or a win or something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything that is deemed newsworthy would fall into that category. And you can do that yourself by, you know, using DIY PR tools, or you can hire an agency that puts an entire public relations strategy in place. It depends, again, on what the goals of your firm are. Now, the other two areas are inbound marketing, where it very much ties to the name. You want to draw people in by offering them a piece of content, such as a ebook or a PDF that they can download or the ability to click on something in an email and drive them into your list or into your website to capture their information. Inbound marketing is often done at the beginning uh, of a practice to build cash flow and to generate clients through marketing activities because inbound activities are the least costly out of any of the three areas because what you're doing is you're producing the content yourself most often. You're relying on your existing network to generate those contacts and referrals as you're just getting started. So I often refer to inbound marketing as grassroots marketing. You're doing social media. You're doing email campaigns. All of those activities are going to fall into the inbound strategy. And then the third component or third area is digital marketing, which is SEO, search engine optimization, which happens on your website where you are purposefully architecting the content on page, which is what people actually see, but then also the metadata behind what they see in the back end of your website, which we could do an entire hour show on just sure, <laughs> sure. how that breaks down. SEO, search engine optimization, and then PPC, which stands for pay-per-click, where you are actually buying AdWords, you're buying placement, you're doing retargeting and display. So that is actually digital advertising or digital marketing. So you have the three areas. You have public relations media, inbound marketing, and then 
digital, which is the umbrella that encompasses SEO, PPC, and actual the purchase of traffic. And, and digital is really the purchase of traffic, which the hardest part about digital marketing is that it is essentially like sand running through an hourglass, only it's money. <laughs> and so you have to make sure that whatever you're doing in your digital strategy is closely monitored. Oftentimes, this is managed by an agency. I do recommend that you have an agency that this is all that they do managing it because you'd be bidding on keywords and changing things out throughout the course of the day. And you can set up a campaign and walk out of the room and come back and $5,000 has gone out the door. So it will evaporate your budget right in front of you if it's not watched and monitored properly. So that's, that's one to be careful with, but can be very, very very successful. Cool. And that helps a lot. And what's interesting is like the inbound is one that I think, like you said, it it can be done very efficiently, very inexpensively. Um, But I think a lot of people stumble over it because the name of it suggests that it just magically creates people calling in, but it's really putting your message out there in a variety of ways uh, by speaking, by blogging, by tweeting by doing whatever you need to do to get people to come in and consume your content. Yes, that is a great way. And, I, and it wouldn't it be wonderful if, if it just came in from, from turning it on. And that is its consistency. Uh, you have the ability, the internet loves content. Google loves content. So, and what they want is they want to see consistently fresh ideas, fresh offers, fresh articles, uh, fresh events, and that timeline, keeping up that timeline is one of the keys to a successful inbound strategy. So if I write a blog today uh, and maybe spread it out on all of my social media profiles, it will decrease in the amount of traffic that it's bringing in over time, just by nature. So oftentimes people will write a blog, they'll put something out to the world, their website will get a ton of traffic, they'll get a ton of attention, but then a couple of days later, you know, that attention has fallen off. And the key is to consistently be putting out material and sharing with your audience, which is constantly changing, constantly growing, so that the world knows that there's a consistent stream of information coming from this source, which establishes you as an expert. It establishes the specialty or the niche that your practice may focus on and draws people who are looking for that particular service to you, which is why um, it's so important to focus the area of law that you want to bring in clients for. Uh, Focus your content on that area. Focus the thought leadership and development and content that you're writing on that area. Because if you're writing about six different practice areas, you're really not making progress in any one of those. You're just kind of spinning your wheels. So the more focused that that content can be and then the more consistent of a schedule you can deliver on. And if you can't deliver on it yourself, then later on in today's session, I think we're going to get into some options on how to maintain that. The more successful your inbound campaigns will be. So focused content being number one and then number two, that keeping up that consistency. Right. And it would also seem to me, just like listening to how you've explained it, that I've seen, I think, people make this mistake in that they'll do the digital because it's money. They feel like they don't have to create content. They just go out and do pay-per-click, just go out and do things to get their message out there without balancing it with the inbound. But from the way you've explained it, it would seem like the best approach here would be to have a balance of good content, good inbound marketing, then supported by digital marketing that is measured and carefully managed by an agency. Absolutely. They go hand in hand. And you can drive traffic. You can buy website visitors and and force them to go to your site. But what they see when they arrive, if it doesn't speak to the problem that they have, and I always kind of use this generic example, like nobody knows what Smith & Smith does. Smith and Smith could be, you know, any type of business. It could be any area of law. And so when you are paying all of this money to drive uh, traffic to your site, the message that they see when they get there and how they interact with what you have the ability to tell them to educate them on is going to determine whether or not you can nurture them into a prospect or into a potential appointment or into a potential 
sales call because when they come to a site that is very general, if it doesn't speak to the situation that they're in at the moment that they decide to search out for an attorney, and I, and I always advise the firms that I work with to put themselves in their client's shoes and to think about what was happening the day that they decided to pick up the phone and make that call because reaching out to a lawyer is is a very scary thing for a lot of people. And so when they arrive on your site, and we'll just use family law as an example or bankruptcy as an example, when they arrive on your site and they see images of a family or images of a child between two parents or images of um, a potential custody situation or whatever the case may be, they are going to be more inclined to stay there than if they arrive and they see courthouse steps, Sure, which I so often see on so many websites or a gavel or the scales of justice that doesn't speak to the potential client that you're trying to attract, which comes back to the filtering. We want that message and we want the images that they see to resonate. And the human brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text. So that first impression, I cannot stress enough how important that is when they arrive, because otherwise you've paid, you know, potentially 60, 70, you know, 50, 40, doesn't matter how much you've spent to get that visitor there, they're going to leave right away and you have to start all over again. Right. Okay. So what we're going to do here is take a break to have a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to talk about using the concepts that we've just talked about, the three areas of marketing and the two jobs of marketing, and how to put that together to build a marketing plan. We're going to talk about like how lawyers aren't doing that right, how vendors aren't doing that right for lawyers, and then what's really in a marketing plan. And then we'll, we'll go on to talk about measuring it and, uh, like you said, some strategies around how to get the content done. Uh, but for right now, we'll take a break and we'll be back in just a moment. Is your firm experiencing missed calls, empty voicemail boxes, and potential clients you'll never hear from again? Enter Answer One Virtual Receptionists. They're more than just an answering service. Answer One is available 24 7. They can even schedule appointments, respond to emails, integrate with Clio, and much more. Answer One helps make sure your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 1 800 Answer One or visit them at answerone.com slash podcast for a special offer. That's answer the number one dot com slash podcast. Welcome back. We're with the Unbillable Hour and talking to our guest, Chelsea Lambert, about your marketing game plan for 2017. When we left off, we had been talking about the two jobs of marketing and then also which were to attract people to your door and then also to make sure that you're not allowing people that the business should not be doing business with to get into the door to work with sales or to get into the factory to protect the business from people you shouldn't be working with. We then talked about three main areas of marketing and how they play together, how important PR and media are, and then how inbound marketing, which is uh, the marketing where your message is out there in the world attracting people to consume content that you've created, plays with digital marketing like pay-per-click or like social media where you're paying uh, for eyeballs and having those two things work together. So what we wanted to talk about now, what I wanted to have Chelsea kind of walk us through, is what it is then to put these concepts together into an effective and manageable marketing plan. Chelsea, from my experience, a lot of law firms consume marketing services. They hire agencies, they hire website designers and builders, they do social media, they pay for pay-per-click, but they don't really have an overall marketing plan. In your experience, how is it that most lawyers out there that you've seen, talked to, et cetera, conceive of their marketing plan? They, it's, I call it splatter paint marketing because it just seems like there is a, a point where they realize that they're halfway through a case or group of cases and they're, they say, oh, I need to go do some business development or I need to do some marketing because once these cases are done, I'm going to have a lull or I'm going to have a cash flow issue or something like that. And so by not having a marketing plan, one, it goes much, much farther than just marketing. I find that when a plan is not in place, they actually make business decisions that hurt the law firm. So you find yourself in a more reactive mode. So you might spend more on marketing than you should have for a certain 
type of campaign. Um, you also might take a client that you're a little bit maybe in a desperate situation because of a cash flow or a business development issue, and you feel like you need to just bring clients on so that you can make it through the next quarter. And so you make more reactive decisions when you don't have a plan. That's number one. Number two, you cannot predict your marketing spend because opportunities will come along and either you don't have the marketing budget to take advantage of them. Like, for example, we're coming on the end of the year, so now is a really good time to negotiate with your marketing providers, especially maybe if you have some extra budget left over that you want to get off the books, you can take advantage of the fact that they're coming up on the end of the year. You can negotiate lower rates. And when you don't have a plan, you can't take advantage of opportunities in that way because you just have no handle on what your budget um, or your needs are. And then number three, they don't plan out over the course of a calendar year what the most opportunistic times are for their marketing. And this is different for different practice areas. Sure, and I'm just yeah. going to share you know, a couple quick examples. So for bankruptcy, first quarter, huge marketing quarter for bankruptcy firms because there are so many people out there who tax time is the only time where they might have 1500 or 2000 or however much it might cost to file bankruptcy laying around that because they get their tax return. And so getting out in front of those people during the first quarter when they're filing their taxes and using that as an opportunity for them to, to offer them uh, this fresh start and to leverage the fact that, Hey, you have this, Let's get this pain and this burden and, and this crippling force in your life out of the way during a time where you actually have the financial means to do that. That's one practice area. Another practice area would be criminal defense and DUI, where just statistically the number of offenses increase between the months of November, uh, the, actually October and December, between Halloween and right after the new year. So are you buying more PPC ads? Are you going to do a billboard? You know, things like that. So knowing when statistically filings are higher, um, domestic violence, family law also have cyclical times that unfortunately tie to a lot of the major holidays, Valentine's Day for family law and divorce. So as uh, unsettling as it might be to think about those times of the year, you have to put yourself in a position where you plan to spend more marketing dollars around those events because that's where a majority of the business or the highest quality potential clients are going to come to you, you know, during that time frame and to plan to allocate your marketing budget, giving yourself enough leeway and time to get those campaigns ready or to have someone working on them, you know, not on the night before or a couple of days before so that they're actually executed properly. Again, going back to not, you know, being reactive and spending more money than you have to. And then also having a tax. So this is something that I was so pleased to see when I came to how to manage a small law firm. Not only do we teach our members to do this, but we also you know, practice what we preach and we do it internally. So for every new client that comes on, a percentage of the fee that is collected from that client actually goes directly into the marketing budget, which allows you to, one, have marketing money without thinking about it, which is fantastic, but then, two, scale your marketing budget as the business grows because the same amount of money that got you your first round of clients is not the same amount of money that you're going to need when you're double, triple, quadruple the size. Right. So, right. you know, having that plan is something that you really as a business can't live without. Right. And it's, I think that's uh, been called in some of the literature, um, Eric Reese and the Lean Startup calls that like a client funded marketing, which is basically client funded growth. You're programming growth into uh, your business by funding marketing immediately out of revenues, which is really brilliant. So you've explained how like most lawyers kind of just do marketing as an emergency thing almost where they hopefully see a shortfall coming and then drum up some marketing to get it done um, rather than having a year long plan that takes advantage of uh, timing. And also I think I don't think you explicitly said it with this, but it's implicit from what you said earlier. Take advantage of consistency, right? Your marketing is going to be much more effective if you're consistent, consistent, consistent. And one of the conundrums that I see out there, though, is that while what you say, I mean, I've seen it, it's absolutely true. A lot of the people who sell marketing services, a lot of the vendors out there who sell pay-per-click, who sell social media management, who sell 
being a marketing manager for your business, who sell law firm marketing services, who sell websites, while they do a great job at the things that they sell, they don't often do a whole lot to help their clients form a plan. So what I was hoping you might do is explain a little bit to the listeners about what a marketing plan looks like. Like, what are the elements of a marketing plan? How do you figure out what your marketing spend should be? Yes, absolutely. So I like to start with a calendar. So, you know, the 12 month calendar where it's beginning, you know, coming into 2017 and laying out that calendar over a 12 month period and then identifying the areas Maybe it's holidays, maybe it's seasonal, maybe it's just at peak times of the year that you've noticed as you've been practicing or seen in your particular practice area where you know that it is most advantageous to market. Now that tax is going to be happening the entire way. So you know that you're going to have the budget to spend on the things that you need. After you've identified the key times of the year that you're going to need to push marketing around certain events, or there's certain goals that you have, like the number of clients that you would like to acquire every single month. And this should be a set of KPIs that you have in your business. You should know if you generate, let's say, 50 leads, that 10 of them are going to actually get on the phone with you, five of them are actually going to show up for appointments, and maybe two or three are actually going to become clients. So knowing what that conversion ratio looks like, and the better your marketing is, and the more on target your message is to their particular pain point or situation, the better that those numbers will be. And also referral sources, very, very high quality referral sources will impact those conversion rates as well. So understanding what your lead to appointment to client numbers are is key in this process. And once you've identified those two things, what your typical conversion rates are and the times of the year that you need to bring in business or it's most likely that you will bring in business, then you create what we call campaigns. And a campaign can be something like a monthly newsletter. Where All right, so Chelsea, let me just interrupt you a second. You're talking about uh, going into a campaign and you, you outlined like uh, some of the things in a marketing plan to make sure that you you know your conversion rates from people that see your message to how many people call or take an action to how many people actually schedule an appointment. And what I wanted to do is just sort of take one step back. And because what's implicit in what you said is that lawyers actually need to start with the question of how many new cases do they want to get? How many appointments do they want to get? And that question actually comes from how much revenue do you want? So if you know how much revenue you need to have this year, this quarter, this month, and you know what your average case value is, that's how you know how a lawyer would start their marketing plan to know how many leads, how many appointments they need to get. Does that make sense for what you were saying? That is completely accurate. And that goes hand in hand. The marketing plan goes hand in hand with the business plan because marketing drives the front end of the business. It drives the revenue that you're going to generate, the amount of money you're going to have to spend on marketing to hit those revenue numbers, and also where you are going to spend those marketing dollars if you're relying more heavily on referral sources and you need to spend your personal time or lunches or coffee meetings or what have you to foster those referral relationships, or if you're going to be able to drive them through a digital strategy to hit the number of appointments that you are going to need every month in order to convert those appointments into cases, which should be tied to a case value and tied back to your overall revenue numbers. And for any practice area, the funnel that you really need to be watching like a hawk, I mean, just And if you're not watching this, then having an agency partner, having a support person or staff person um, run these reports for you on a weekly basis is something that's fairly easy to do, Um, is the number of leads, the sources where they are coming from, the number of appointments that are generated from those leads and the sources, and then the number of clients. And if you don't know what these numbers are, like let's say you're just getting started or you've changed practice areas or you're really trying to to focus on one particular area of law, then guess or ask around so that you at least have a baseline or a goal. And then as you collect your data, because a lot of firms don't 
track these things, especially when they're getting started. And the sooner that you can collect the data, the sooner you're going to be able to make more intelligent decisions about where you're spending your money, where to move it when it's not working. I always say a lot of marketing is moving money because when something doesn't work, we take that money and we move it right over here into something that does. So that you're constantly improving and you're constantly trying to increase that number of appointments and increase that number of appointments that that turn into actually paying clients and quality clients that you're not going to have fee discrepancies with because they're being presented the right message because they're being sold the, the appropriate service. And that all ties back in the end to your revenue numbers. So once you know where your leads are coming from, so the sources that are most successful for you, the lead sources that are converting most often into appointments in, that actually show up. So you, even if you want to take it a step further, you can track show and no show rates. Um, because one lead source might give you a ton of appointments, but the people never show up. So what is the actual lead quality there? That's the question that you have to ask yourself. And then out of those appointments, the ones that turn into quality clients who pay. Mm -hmm. So that is the overall funnel. And once you have those numbers, those metrics in place, which in an ideal world, you would be reporting on on a weekly basis at an absolute minimum, you need to be reporting on them each month. Because the longer that you go without reporting, the more money that you have have being spent without knowing whether or not it's working. So that is absolutely critical. And once you have an idea of those numbers, then you can actually start to build campaigns and to increase the number of leads, increase the number of appointments, and increase the number of clients that you're going to be able to convert by adding campaigns or adding marketing activities. Marketing activities and campaigns are kind of interchangeable terms. Um, It just depends on what you're most comfortable with. But a campaign could be anything from a speaking engagement to a email newsletter or a downloadable ebook or an article that was published in a local publication or a national publication or a blog article on your website that is tied to a form. Any of one of those examples can be called a campaign or a marketing activity. And you add more and more campaigns to increase the number of leads, to increase the number of appointments to hit those revenue goals. To hit your numbers. Cool. And it sounds like, I mean, very much what you're saying is... um, (laughs) Basically, whether you have a track record and you make your estimates, your hypotheses for how the marketing funnel is going to work from your track record or whether you just make educated guesses, it sounds like you're saying you really shouldn't do anything unless you're able to measure it and compare it to what you thought was going to happen. Absolutely. If you are not measuring what you are doing from a financial and time impact, to be completely honest, because What happens if you light up a marketing campaign and all of a sudden you are book solid with appointments and you also have to deliver too? So it's beyond just a financial spend, but there's a time component um, that impacts you and your entire staff, entire firm as well. So you have to at least put a guess in place. And then as you grow, as you do more marketing, your own data and real data will replace that guess. And you know, it's interesting to see how, how close or how far off you are. Yeah. So we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to be sure we hit one last thing that I think the listeners would really find value in. Is That's when you and I were talking in preparation for the show. You emphasized to me the importance of whether you're doing blogging or speaking or other activities that create content, that you find a way to reuse the content, reuse the content in a variety of different means. Can you explain what that means to the listeners and how they can put that strategy to use for them in their marketing? Oh, absolutely. I have had so many conversations. This is something I'm really, really adamant about. Uh, I've had so, so many conversations with small firms who have gotten disheartened, uh, especially solo practitioners who have gotten disheartened doing their, their own marketing because they pour themselves into a speaking engagement or into a blog post or into an article that gets published And they spend all of this time and energy putting it together. And it goes out into the world and it's shared all over social media and they ride this marketing high for for a a week or two weeks and then it dissipates. 
the attention goes away and they get so caught up in this initial feeling of how awesome it was when it first went out that they feel like it's over and they get disheartened. And then mm. they're like, well, it only lasts for a couple of weeks. So why should I spend the time to do it again? I've heard this story a hundred times. And it's because what is the disconnect there is that every single time that you create something, that you deliver something, that is an asset. You are creating a library of marketing assets. So have someone or even on your phone record the speech that you give or the talk and then transcribe it into an article and then um, or take that blog post and post it on social media and then schedule it again to go out another 90 days later. Because what also happens is that the audience that you have today is not the audience that you're going to have 60 days from now, 120 days from now, a year from now. That audience is going to change, it's going to evolve, it's going to grow. Also, I would remind everybody that the sheer volume of content and news that's coming at us on a daily basis, what you may have pushed out into the world the first time could have got lost in the mix of you know, the Facebook holiday feeds or like it seems like baby and engagement season or whatever was going on during that time um, in their life or in their world. So you have to consistently reuse that content, which is great because it means you don't have to create new stuff all the time. You can take a blog post and then repurpose it in an email newsletter or repurpose it in an email campaign. You can record a speaking engagement or get video permission to video a speaking engagement and then put it on a YouTube channel or on your website or even link to that video in an email that you send out to your list. So every time you produce something, you are creating an asset that has value. And just to kind of tie a dollar amount to some of these things, the average value of acquiring an email address is $75. Wow. So if you have a blog post, a video, because it's the amount of time and effort that goes into it, and, and that could be different, you know, based on your practice area or specialty, but if you actually think about the time that it takes to acquire that email address and write that article or take a half a day out of the office to do that speaking engagement, you owe it to yourself to reuse that piece of content over and over again. And the good news is, is that if you repurpose it correctly, or if you write it in such a way that it is what we call evergreen, it can be used in almost any version of media, so written or uh, watched or audio or any of, of the vehicles that, that people might come across. But then it can live on for you know, two, three years sometimes where you're using it over and over again, not to mention the fact that now you have a library. So if an opportunity for a speaking engagement or an opportunity for a talk or an event or a publication wants you to write something for them, you've saved that article. And it's not just some link out on the internet that you can't find again. You've saved that article and now you can quickly turn around and show how prompt and professional you are by saying, absolutely, I actually have a Dropbox folder full of articles that I've written over the last two years. Here's a sample of my work. What can I help you with? And they're going to be much more inclined to publish something about your firm when you have this library. Fantastic. And it shows the expertise and thought leadership that you've built. Yeah, that makes such total sense. I think it's going to be really valuable. So that wraps up this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Business Advisory Podcast. Chelsea, thank you so very much for sharing some of these insights on marketing. Really appreciate it. Would it be okay if I offered or asked you um, whether you could perhaps uh, have available for our listeners um, a sample marketing plan and maybe some sample things that they can do, like talk about blog posts or you know, just some sample marketing activities that they could do, um, have that available for them? Yeah, absolutely. I would be happy to help. Cool. And thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So our guest today has been Chelsea Lambert, and you can learn more about her by uh, emailing her at chelsea.lambert at howtomanageasmalllawfirm.com. And uh, you can look for some of the materials that Chelsea was talking about by going to www.howtomanageasmalllawfirm.com forward slash U-B-H for unbillable hour. Howtomanageasmalllawfirm.com slash U-B-H. Chelsea is also available on Twitter at Chelsea Lambert and LinkedIn at slash Chelsea Lambert. 
My name, of course, is Christopher Anderson, and I look forward to seeing you next month with another great guest as we learn more about topics that help us build the law firm business that works for you. And remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thanks for listening to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. Join us again for the next edition, right here with Legal Talk Network.